difficult talk of the meeting, which is clinical challenges in hepatitis C. Um, many of you may think there really are no remaining challenges, but I'll also point out that hepatitis C is actually where we want hepatitis B to be in several years from now. And it's the result of basic science work and clinical translation that's led us with just a handful of clinical challenges that remain. So I will go through some of the things that I see as pressing issues, but they're not translational from the uh, lab to the clinic, but more from the clinical trials to the community and to the population, as well as a couple of interesting uh, scenarios. So these are my disclosures. So what I'm going to do is talk about the first challenge, which I entitled case finding. Uh, this is the test, treat, and cure model where we need to identify people, link them to treating clinicians, and deliver cure. Sounds very easy, and in the right context, in fact, it is easy. Unfortunately, we're treating human beings, uh, not laboratory mice or other experimental models. It's somewhat difficult uh, in many settings to test, treat, and cure. I'll then talk about the interesting issue of transplantation and hepatitis C, I'll touch on what's going on in the US uh, with respect to the use of hepatitis C positive organs. And finally, I'll talk about virologic failure. There was a uh, presentation at the WSLDB that suggested we may have patients that can't be cured virologically. I suspect that's not true, and I'll explain why. So let me start with a patient. This was a 22-year-old woman. Uh, opiate use disorder, found to have the LVAT, ALT level of 146 when she presented for treatment. She missed two new patient evaluations, finally came in, genotype 1A, F0, highly motivated for cure. Uh, explained that this was the most important thing at that point of her recovery. Uh, then missed the follow-up appointment, finally came back, reaffirmed motivation, was approved to be treated, and did not show multiple contacts for treatment initiation, and to this day has not initiated treatment despite showing up to clinic, obtaining approval, and we're still, we haven't given up, we'll still continue to try. But here we've failed, not on the diagnosis, not the linkage to care, but on the initiation of treatment. So a couple things to point out. After the approval of DAAs, there is a rapid uptake and I took this data from uh, Jules Levin's web, NATAP website that looks at sales of estimated hepatitis C starts in thousands of people. You see 2014, 2015, and then you see a decline. So in the United States, you had a rapid approval, you had a number of people rushing forward to be treated, and a large number treated. But we're already seeing a decline in number of human beings presenting and getting started on treatment. And then data from Andrew Hill estimating the global decline in prevalence, about 1.3 million, maybe 3 million people treated. Sounds like quite a bit. Historically, it is. But yet, we still have just put a dent in the number of human beings on the planet with hepatitis C. Now, I'm not suggesting we haven't got a result for that investment in the million or so Americans who have been treated. You see from this study in gastroenterology a very large uptake on Medicare prescriptions. Now this is an early uptake. And then you can see the change in transplantation wait listing. And this is from the gastro paper from David Goldberg. You see the hepatitis C has already dropped. If you had asked me would you see a decline in hepatitis C that quickly, I would have suggested no. But we're treating older cirrhotic patients and seeing benefit. Now, those of you looking at NASH, you, you, many people like to say NASH is number two. The way I read this slide, it's actually alcohol liver disease is the number two cause of liver transplantation uh, behind hep C and maybe number one by this point in time. So alcohol remains an important issue. So there's a couple things that happen when you introduce DAAs. And it's reflected in a couple of places. If you look in the Check C cohort, this is a large cohort that's been funded by the CDC. They treated 5.6% of 9,500 patients. They were white, they had private insurance, higher income, and HIV co-infection. These were the low-hanging fruit, people that could easily access therapy. And in this study from Chatwall and colleagues, it's a model looking at who's left in the US. And you can see that it's the non-enhanced population, still 2.8 million people, half of whom are in the non-enhanced population, enriched for persons who use drugs and those incarcerated. So this cartoon depicts the uh, Big Island donkey trying to go after the low-hanging fruit, but you can see they're not there anymore. The patients we're trying to treat are now harder to reach and more difficult to obtain cure. 
So here's a, a study done in the Johns Hopkins ER that looked at undiagnosed people screened in the ER. And you see two bubbles. In the middle is the baby boomers, where about 10% of black men and women are hep C infected, and many of whom are undiagnosed. But you also see in the square this younger population where about 5% of non-black men are hep C infected. And you're seeing two epidemics here reflected walking into the ER. Now, many people have looked at ER screening as a place to identify patients. And certainly you can identify them there, but it is extraordinarily difficult to get someone to go from a screening test in the ER to clinic because they did not come to the ER for hepatitis C. Great place to screen and identify cases, very difficult to link to care. And part of the issue that you see on that slide is that there is a shift in the epidemic to rural communities and younger adults. This slide was showed earlier, I think Andrew Aronson on the first day showed this, but you look at this shift to the rural, non-urban settings of the US in people under the age of 30 driven by injection drug use. Now a study published this year from rural Kentucky 503 persons who inject drugs tested, half were hep C positive, only 8% have been treated. Why? In part because there's very few healthcare providers in rural Kentucky and very few that are trained to treat hepatitis C. There's no infrastructure present. So there was a recent study published from a CDC initiative that looked at a study called Hep TLC, 10 centers that targeted area uh, regions that deliver uh, care to persons who inject drugs. 23% of those tested were hepatitis C positive. You can see the types of individuals here, 60% uh, men, a large representation of women as well, the median age of, uh, in many cases, 37 or younger. And most of this was driven by injection drug use. In the same paper, they looked at their care cascade. And overall, they identified 3,495 people. Uh, most had not been tested for RNA, so this reflex testing or point of care RNA testing is critical for that step. And then if you look at how many made it to their hep C appointment. Now keep in mind, they were asked to leave the addiction treatment center, go to a specialist care at a scheduled place and time. Not many did it, 198 out of the 1,600 with RNA. So as far as a care continuum goes, this is really not very good. You'd like it to look like this. And it shows you the amount of work that we have to raise the number, not even treated, that attend their first appointment. So this leads me to Willie Sutton. And uh, for those of you who are not uh, familiar with Willie Sutton, he was a bank robber in the early part of the 19th, uh, 20th century. And when they finally caught Willie Sutton, they asked him why he robbed banks. And there's some dispute about this, but Willie said, I rob banks because that's where the money is. Now, he actually, in his uh, uh, autobiography, said he didn't actually say that. I think he should take credit for it. It's a pretty good way to think about the problem. And the problem is we are asking people to see specialists in academic settings or private care offices. And that's not where this patient population is. We need to go to the patients and follow what's become known as Sutton's Law. Now, there are a lot of barriers. This is some work that Al Litwin presented at the most recent liver meeting in Washington. People were asked, to, people who uh, delivered care to this population were asked to rank barriers. And I won't go through these, but there's system barriers, lack of funding, uh, long wait periods to see a specialist, six months. You're not going to wait six months in this population. And then there's patient barriers. Hepatitis C is asymptomatic. Like my patient, she was highly motivated to be cured. But things came up that prevented her from being cured on our schedule. And we need to figure out what her schedule is and how to deliver care in that context. So multiple barriers, both health systems as well as patient barriers. So the first that should be self-evident is the health system should deliver, not deny, hepatitis C cure. And in too many parts of the world, including uh, certain regions of the United States, you see barriers of clinical criteria, minimal fibrosis scores, uh, you see a large amount of paperwork, you see things like uh, alcohol and substance use abstinence. All these things represent barriers to actual treatment, and some of them are truly meant to be barriers, just to limit the number of people getting treated. So health systems need to work to deliver care, not deny care. Now, what about this idea of not getting patients started? Uh, this came up uh, on the first day, uh, this idea of linking people using uh, novel interventions. And we conducted a trial called the CHAMP study at Johns Hopkins, and we did it in an easy-to-treat population. These are people linked to HIV care already. 
but for reasons not clear to us, they had not come to an on-site hep C treatment visit and not been evaluated. And if we're going to eliminate hepatitis C in this group, we need to find ways to do it. So we took a group of individuals, it ended up being about 560 that were not cured, and 287, we couldn't reach them. They may have been incarcerated or lost a follow-up. Uh, 460 of the 900 were already in care and only 13 declined. We randomized people to usual care, an intensive nursing model, peer mentor care, they were paired with an HIV hep C co-infected person who had already been cured to provide support, not navigation, or we offer cash incentives up to $220 over a 12-week course and we remove system barriers. We gave them access to free lodiposphere sulfosphere and we gave them access to specialists at their convenience. And you can see the population of patients. I'll point out that 46% had cocaine or heroin in their urine. By using PETH, which is a biomarker of alcohol, very specific, uh, about 33% or a third had heavy amounts of alcohol in their urine, or I'm sorry, in their blood. I will point out this did not impact care. I'll also point out that we also did audits, and half of the people who had PETH in their blood reported they were not drinking. So there were also other comorbidities uh, like depression. What we saw was that treatment initiation, 83% of peers one-third of those given free therapy and access to care did not start treatment. One out of three. That went up to only 17% not starting. SVR, once you got going, was quite good, 91%. Once things started to roll, people did very well in all groups. And cash incentives had some impact as well. But I wanted to point out that in our modeling, in our look at this data, drug use, alcohol use had no impact whatsoever on your ability to initiate treatment or your ability to become cured once starting therapy. So we need novel ways to move people along the care continuum, not simply waiting for them to come to us. And at least our take in these data as peer mentors may be a good methodology to consider uh, in this patient population. Of course, it's also about moving the treatment to the patient. This is our Litwin study uh, called Prevail, where they gave treatment in a methadone or opiate agonist treatment program. It makes perfect sense to deliver therapy in that setting, and they used uh, directly observed therapy, group therapy, individual therapy. Well, everyone did well. You can see the SVR rates between 90 and 98%. Very few patients failed. And I will point out that adherence wasn't all that spectacular. One of the other things that we're seeing in this population is that you can miss doses of treatment and still achieve cure. I'm not suggesting we do that, but we don't necessarily need to deliver 100% of pills. I'm not suggesting we would uh, try to encourage non-adherence, but these treatments are more effective in the community in part because of the forgiveness factor. Now, what about the idea of not using specialists? Why do they have to come to me at an academic medical center? Why can't they be treated in their medical home? And this is a CDC-funded study in Baltimore. We train people working in federally qualified health centers with a combination of didactics and telemedicine. Chicago and Seattle, Andrew Aronson and John Scott, they used an ECHO model, the classic ECHO model, model pioneered by Sanjeev Arora. And you can see the number of patients treated and the number of trained providers. These individuals can offer treatment, and Baltimore Healthcare for the Homeless has been wildly successful in delivering treatment to their patient population. But do we even need specialists? Do we even need clinicians? Do we even need laboratory tests? Perhaps the system is creating barriers. And I'll touch briefly on the Min Mon study that is uh, designed and will be implemented shortly by the ACTG, a single arm study of SoftVel for persons with active ACV infection being done at sites around the world. No pretreatment genotyping, a CBC, a chem profile, HCV RNA, a FIB4, and a YES viremic. They get education, counseling, they get all 84 tablets of SoftVel. No schedule of clinic appointments, no schedule monitoring laboratory-wise, and contact by method of choice remote uh, over the next 12 weeks, and another viral load six months after starting treatment. Do we even need all the barriers we put in place? And I suspect the answer may be no, but it needs to be studied and will be in the MinMon protocol. So let me shift gears completely to a couple other cases from clinic. A 56-year-old man with hep C on dialysis Evaluated and listed for kidney transplant, he's instructed not to be cured. The idea is he should remain hep C positive to take a hep C positive organ. 
And I'll tell you about another man who's a 62-year-old with idiopathic cardiomyopathy. He does not have hepatitis C. Evaluated and listed for transplant. The wait list for heart transplants is long. You typically have to have a left ventricular assist device before you actually qualify. And it is a perilous road uh, to a heart. So how does the hepatitis C epidemic infect these two? Well, for those of you who are not familiar with the U.S. opiate epidemic, I would uh, direct you to this book by Sam Quinones, Dreamland. And this is the story of opiates in the U.S. It starts with Vicodin in 1978. There is a famous letter in New England Journal of Medicine in 1980. There is pain as, the, as a vital sign in the 1990s. And then there is Purdue Pharma and an increase in opiate use around the U.S. There is the influx of uh, heroin from Mexico and other parts of the world. And here we are today with a large number of Americans uh, uh, using opiates with opiate use disorder and unfortunately dying from opiate use disorder. So this looks at the percent of people who have died from overdose deaths in the donor pool in 2000. And this is the opiate overdose death rate in 2000 and this is 2015. These are data put together by Christine Duran and the epidemiology group at Johns Hopkins in transplant. <clears throat> and you can see that there are more uh, opiate overdose death donors now across the U.S. and it's tracking in every state where we're seeing increased overdose deaths in the donor pool. Now these are the data looking a uh, different way showing you over time. This is the increase in overdose deaths entering the donor pool. And these are the hep C positive donors. 25% are hepatitis C positive. So what's happening is there's an influx of hepatitis C positive organs at transplant centers across the US. That's not happening in the medical or trauma deaths as in, in these cases. Now, this is the uh, transplants using these organs. Kidneys, they're using more. Livers, they use them quite frequently. Heart and lung, rarely used. So what about using these organs from hep C positive deceased donors to hep C negative recipients? And there's a couple of ethical considerations I want to look at first. And the first is that this is unacceptable. We can't allow overdose deaths to continue to occur at this rate and be the source of organs for people with end stage disease. And they can and must be prevented. That's a topic for a different forum. But the issue is what to do with these organs? And is there really a medical rationale not to use hepatitis C positive organ? We currently use CMV positive organs and give them to CMV negative recipients. We then give them Valgan cyclovir orally for a long period of time, because CMV is not curable. Hepatitis B, we routinely use core antibody positive livers, and then we give people in Tecavir, because Hep B, as you know from this meeting and other forums, is not curable, it's for a lifetime. So why not use hep C positive organs if we can then cure? And this is the discard rate for kidneys and why my patient was told to wait. The hep C positive kidney, there's, it's, the relative rate of discard is four times higher than a hep C negative kidney. So clearly we're throwing away organs that could uh, leave people off dialysis. So the favoring treatment of this group, so should we treat my patient? Well, hep C positive patients have worse outcomes. So as an individual, maybe we should cure him. The other issue I don't want to forget is that transmission occurs in dialysis centers. There's been more than 20 outbreaks in the last 10 years in the US. And if I were running a hemodialysis center, I would want my patient population to be screened and cured of hep C. On the other hand, this patient can get an organ probably within about a month to three months, and the DAAs are highly effective post-transplant. I won't go into those data. Now, you've probably seen the study from David Goldberg and Penn in New Control of Medicine, so I thought I would focus on a study we did at Hopkins. Uh, we took people who were uh, hep C negative. We gave them grizopavir elbosvir on call to the OR. This is a hep C uninfected person. They then got a hep C positive organ. We did not do genotype testing on the deceased donor. We then genotyped them and we have an algorithm where we either did not change the regimen or we added sofosbuvir. These are the 10 patients. Uh, you can see that we did actually see genotype two and three entering the donor pool. These are the donor viral loads. Many were very low. All were antibody positive. And these are the recipients. None actually acquired hepatitis C. 
If you look at post-op day one, you see a little bit of virus in a couple of patients. These are the ones with high viral loads primarily. That's likely donor virus because in the recipients at week one, two, and 12, we do not see infection established. This is a pre-exposure, post-exposure prophylaxis that could work for kidneys, lungs, and, and heart, but would not work for livers because the liver is obviously infected. Now, what about heart transplant? Well, hearts, hepatitis C is a major barrier. It's because of this data from, uh, I'm sorry, JAMA in 2006. Hep C negative donor survival here, Hep C positive donor survival, that curve does not look very encouraging if you're a heart transplant uh, candidate or a heart transplant surgeon. But this barrier has already been crossed. Vanderbilt reported 13 patients they have transplanted, recipient negative donor positive, and there's a study at Penn. This could make a significant difference in heart transplants as well. What about livers? Well, a very interesting model by Chatwall where he looked at the idea of taking any organ, negative or positive, versus only hep C negative. And what he modeled was that if your MELD score is above 20, you would actually have benefit in terms of your change in quality of life years by accepting any organ. So take the hep C positive organ, iatrogenic hep C infection, and get cured, and that breakpoint is probably a MELD of 20. So something to consider. Now, why is this being considered? Well, as I showed you earlier, the number of people being listed for transplant for hep C has dropped by 35% year over year in this study presented at the liver meeting. Other organs, uh, I'm sorry, other cause of liver disease are increasing, alcohol and NASH, 20% increase. So if you're running a transplant program today, you're going to have more patients who are hep C negative increasingly with cancer or other indications who may benefit from a hep C positive organ. So I think the time is coming for us to rethink our approach to using hep C positive organs. So my last patient is a challenging patient in cure. 63-year-old man, Charles Pugh A, 1A, high viral load, TT, IL-28B, black race, failed PEG interferon. Many of you may not recall these days, but we gave him PEG 2A, or that didn't work, so we gave him PEG 2B, that didn't work. He was a null responder. He then entered a trial, got LDV saw for 12 weeks. We now know he should have got ribavirin longer therapy, but he relapsed. He then got SimSoft plus ribavirin for 24 weeks. He was undetectable, but he relapsed with this resistance profile. So is this patient, both because of host factors as well as viral factors, incurable in the modern era? Well, when we look at HCV target for failures, we see, first of all, they're pretty uncommon. For LDV soft, only 4.1% in this analysis had failed, and overall 6.3%. If we look at the model for who failed, low albumin, high bilirubin, uh, low platelet count, people with advanced cirrhosis uh, are the ones who are failing therapy. So the patient is failing, as are 1A patients. You can see 1A versus 1B here. So he's pretty typical, cirrhotic, bad liver, 1A, failed peg interferon ribavirin in advance, and failed some DAAs. So if we think about elimination, it's important to consider resistance-associated substitutions, but that's not the whole story. It is important to, I think, use active drugs against resistant uh, variants, but it may not be required. It's also considered worth considering the patient. There is a role of host immunity, and we'll talk a bit about that. It's also worth considering cirrhosis. It may be issues with drug delivery, the problem of delivering uh, drug as, uh, to areas of the liver, and that it may be related to the specific regimen. But the question is, can we eliminate hepatitis C in this patient? Well, I do want to mention uh, the host immune system or patient immune system. Rases are not created equal. It matters what the patient looks like as well. So this was a paper in New England Journal of Medicine by Stefan Zoism, 1A CC with the Faldapavir, the Labavir regimen. You can forget those. 1A CC, 75% cure, 1A CT or TT, 32. Same drug regimen. What happened? Well, the immune system in the CC patient controlled the resistant variants. It stopped them from replicating, it prevented their emergence, and the patient got cured. This is the eight weeks of LDV soft, and you can see that as you cut the duration, as you introduce the T allele, the, the rates seem to stop. So a weaker regimen, 
like the BI regimen or perhaps shorter therapy, you may see the host start to emerge. But if we look at rescue, nucleotide analogs have a high barrier to resistance and are active for retreatment. This is Ed Gaines' original study with monotherapy. Now, I'm not suggesting monotherapy, but you'll note here that the monotherapy patients did not break through in this study. And in the study of retreatment of LDV soft plus ribavirin for those who had failed soft, the efficacy was very high. You can recycle or reuse sofosbuvir, the only approved nucleotide analog, and after WSLD, likely to remain the only approved nucleotide nucleoside analog for hep C. What about ribavirin? Well, ribavirin is also a guanosine nucleoside analog, and it prevents emergence of resistance. This is telapavir peg interferon. That's telapavir peg ribavirin. We've all tried to forget this error. It's not a pleasant uh, time in the history of hepatitis C for patients. But you can see by adding ribavirin, the breakthrough rate to telapavir, 1%, no ribavirin, 24%. Ribavirin is pretty effective at preventing the emergence of resistance, and this is the adding ribavirin here to no ribavirin in a weaker regimen. Now, the other thing to point out is sometimes you can take the exact same regimen and cure people. This study was highlighted by Eric Lowitz because the response rate wasn't very good, only 60% if you had baseline NS5A RASIS. But 60% were cured by taking the exact same regimen and giving it again. So sometimes treatment works quite effectively. And in the ION4 study with HIV-infected patients, there, were, there was retreatment after LDV soft for 12 weeks with LDV soft plus ribavirin 24 weeks. What's new? Ribavirin in 24 weeks. And if you look at the resistance profiles here, high levels of resistance in many patients, IL-28BTT, and the vast majority of patients all but one cured, essentially the exact same regimen, adding ribavirin going longer. And surprisingly, soft bell vox for 12 weeks, the response rate did not vary by the presence of resistance-associated substitutions. You can see here NS5A only, both NS3 and NS5A. If you had asked me before this study, would resistance profile make sense, I would have said yes, you must test and tailor the regimen that would have been wrong. In fact, the guidelines panel does not recommend resistance testing prior to retreatment of soft bell vox. So perhaps not as hard as we thought to cure the highly resistant patient. And in fact, my patient was cured with a combination of Elbasvir, Grisopavir, soft, and ribavirin for 16 weeks, and doing quite well, or more than uh, six to nine months since he finished that regimen. So perhaps we won't actually see the incurable patient. And I think the answer to this question is no. Nucleoside, nucleotide analogs, ribavirin, and sofosphere remain active despite failure. Rases in and of themselves aren't the whole story. The immune system matters. And keep in mind the NS3 rases, so glecapavir, for example, those rases will likely diminish over time. So six months after failure, that NS3 or protease ras may not be there. Longer therapy is effective. We can treat 24 weeks. What's the barrier? Well, it's cost. But there's no safety barrier for 24 weeks of treatment. In fact, Michael Curry and colleagues gave SOF for up to 48 weeks in this pre-transplant study. And I'll remind you, they still make interferon and ribavirin. So if we really do get to a patient that can't be cured, I suppose we'd have to reach for interferon and ribavirin. But I suspect it'll be ribavirin, not interferon, that we use in this patient population. So to summarize the things I've touched on today in current challenges, I think the big story is case finding. We have a fundamental disconnect globally between the people treating hepatitis C and the people with hepatitis C, and we need to bridge that disconnect. We also need to remove system barriers, shift from denial to delivery, and that model really needs a lot of work in a lot of places outside of a few that you heard about in the first day, perhaps Iceland, Australia, and Georgia, not the state of Georgia, the country of Georgia. Uh, so we really need to work on test, treat, and cure. But I would caution those of you who enter this field, it's not as easy as one might think. One third of people offered access to free treatment in the HIV clinic that delivered their HIV care did not start treatment. 
This transplant issue, I think, is an interesting one, but I think it may be one that we can solve relatively quickly. I think if we're using hepatitis B core positive livers and CMV positive organs and exposing uninfected persons, the hep C step is a relatively small one. We need data, but I would expect over the next several years we can make that shift where people can use hep C positive organs. More importantly, this is not the way that the United States should expand the deceased donor organ pool. We need to address the problem of opiate addiction. That will both decrease incident hepatitis C, but save lives in the process. And finally, virologic failure. Although we'll continue to see interesting cases of people who have failed with complex resistant profiles, I suspect we can cure these patients, longer therapy, ribavirin, and using more drugs. So thanks for your attention.